good evening and, and welcome to the American University in Cairo, welcome to Oriental Hall, and welcome to uh, a new Tahrir Dialogue. Uh, on behalf of uh, the Dean of the School of uh, Global Affairs and Public Policy, Nabil Fahmi, and on my own behalf, I'd like to welcome you again and to welcome our very good friend, uh, Nasif Hetti, who uh, is generous enough to have come from Beirut uh, to talk to us about uh, Lebanon's current political status. Uh, the, uh, this Tahrir Dialogue was scheduled before the events in Beirut in the last two weeks. And I think uh, it is uh, hardly uh, more becoming to have uh, such a dialogue um, than uh, at this uh, uh, current, uh, current period and current time in uh, the history of Lebanon, in the evolution of Lebanon, but also in the evolution of, um, of the Middle East. Uh, Lebanon is a country uh, dear to, I think, I will not exaggerate if I say to all Arabs. Um, Lebanon has contributed uh, tremendously to the revival of the Arab world. It has contributed to Arabity, to Arab culture. Um, it has a wealth of great people. Uh, it has generated a wealth of ideas. But it's also a country uh, plagued with fragmentation, a country plagued with fractures, with cleavages. And this is probably what makes Lebanon a very interesting um, uh, case uh, in uh, the, uh, the Middle East or the Arab world, um, if we prefer to call this region by its uh, national uh, character. Uh, I will not say more about Lebanon, but let me just uh, say a few words about uh, our host and speaker today, uh, Nasif Hetti, uh, has been uh, a professor here at AUC. He has taught uh, quite a generation of uh, students of political science. Some of his students are here in, in this room today. Some of them have advanced and become professors themselves at, at AUC, notable profes noted professors. Uh, Nasif uh, is a scholar and he's a diplomat. Uh, among, among many different things, he recently, the last, he's now at uh, the University of the Holy Spirit in, um, in Lebanon, but previously he was ambassador of the League of Arab States to Italy, and before that, ambassador of the League of Arab States to France. Uh, he was uh, a diplomatic advisor to the Secretary General of uh, the League of Arab States. Uh, he is on the editorial board of uh, several uh, journals, and I can go on uh, and on. But I'd like to, to point out in particular uh, his authorship of uh, books, The Theory of International Relations, uh, The Arab World and the Five Great Powers, and uh, The Foreign Policies of, uh, of Lebanon. So uh, we have today a practitioner, but you also have um, a theoretician and a student of political science, in particular international uh, relations. Um, I think I apologize because of my voice. I have a terrible flu. So I will stop here and I will ask uh, Nasif to, to talk to you. He will talk for about uh, 30 minutes after which I may have a couple of questions, uh, clarification that I may seek from him, and then the floor will be open to, to all of you. So welcome again, and welcome, Nasif, and the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, uh, dear Ibrahim. It's a pleasure to be back uh, to AUC, where I spent nice time, great time, when I was next door at the Arab League, so I would cross from the ugly real world to the world of academia. Uh, it wouldn't take much just to cross Tahrir Square at that time. And coming back to Egypt is something very important personally for me, seeing some of my former students or now colleagues, something of which I'm extremely proud and some good old friends all around. Uh, it was not a conspiracy to decide on this topic a month and a half back, especially that we live in the Arab world where we believe a lot in the Agatha Christie interpretation of history. Everything is conspiratorial, everything is prepared uh, for that matter. 
it was to talk about Lebanon, so I will try to be, as my good friend Brahim mentioned, brief in a telegraphic notes fashion to speak first about the Lebanese specificity, the type of the political system in Lebanon, which I will explain invites, begs sometimes interferences and interventions, then to talk about uh, the disordered or the anarchical regional order around Lebanon, particularly around Syria, of which we are an extension in a way strategically. And last but not least, of course, uh, to talk about uh, the what I call in an article the WhatsApp Antifada currently in Lebanon for the $6 a month. But that was the trigger of, of a very serious problem that was going on in Lebanon. And of course, I would love to after try to clarify and uh, uh, discuss and analyze a bit more any, any, any question. Uh, first and foremost, uh, we have a joke that became a reality in Lebanon. Over years, we say that the Lebanese state is the most neutral state in the world. It doesn't even interfere in its own domestic affairs, generally speaking. To suggest that the country was always open, was always, in a way, a theater of confrontation, by proxy confrontation, a mailbox for all kinds of crises in the Arab, Middle East, international orders, via southern Lebanon, via different places in Lebanon. That's our history, unfortunately. The main reason, as I mentioned, we have a very dynamic society, but we had a very weak state, almost stateless in a way, uh, and also the mode of government, what's known as the model of consociational democracy in Lebanon, the consensus among different communities, among here different say, religious communities, would render the system very representative, of course, inclusive, based on communitarism, not on citizenship, but at the same time would create a level of real decision making between the citizen and the state. So everything goes up and down via this Berlin Wall that was really a Berlin Wall going on. And at the same time, that matter was also expressed in a sort of political and ideological transnational solidarities. The history of Lebanon as such, for instance, during the presence of the Palestinian Revolution in Lebanon, without going into history, for some Lebanon was and should have been the Hanoi for the Palestinian Revolution. For the others, it should be the Switzerland. We're not concerned at all. So this is one reason to interpret what we had as fighting. Later, Lebanon was subcontracted to Syria after the Ta'if agreement, though before it was already there, by Arabs and other powers to stabilize the situation. So there was always this possibility. But the reason lies deeply, I'm not just distributing here accusation internally, externally, that the type of the system not only allows, it invites all forms of interferences and interventions. Today we could see the country, let me start by putting it at the end, the country is highly split between factions, pro-Iranian factions, not necessarily ideologically, some are, some are not, and pro-Arab-American alliance on the other hand. So basically, what we could see always, our foreign policy, or foreign policies, I made an argument in the past about Lebanon foreign policies in an article, that political communitarism, the communitarism politique at Ta'afi, each one has its own foreign policy. And then the summation of it is expressed through the state by paralysis. Or if you go a bit further on that side or that side, you end up in a crisis, or you end up in a civil war, or you end up in a conflict here and there. So basically, at one point of time, unfortunately, we needed always a nanny. Syria played that role as a nanny, just to take care of this guy who couldn't really put in order his house after the reaching of the you know, uh, Ta'if Accord. By the way, tomorrow it'll be the 30th anniversary of, of the Ta'if Accord that became the new system of distribution of power. So this communal system, consociation democracy, which is representative not of citizenship, but of communities, but here it's not in terms of religious communities. It's religious at the basis, but it's political in terms of affiliation. Not every member of the community is on that matter, but leaders, communal leaders, would use that to profit in their trans-Lebanese alliances at the regional level and international level. So that's inviting intervention, and that made Lebanon, what I mentioned in the first place, a sort of mailbox. In the Arab-Israeli conflict, it was a mailbox. In regional Cold War in the region, it was a mailbox for many reasons, and it was also the only active place, playground, for all forms of by proxy confrontations. Lebanese were fighting, but were fighting on behalf of X, Y, or Z, with the support of X, Y, or Z at different phases of our history. That's one thing to talk about this specificity 
unfortunate specificity of Lebanon, where the society was extremely vibrant, active, dynamic, but we didn't have a sort of statehood. We didn't have a, a real contrat social, a social contract of integration, whereas to set what are the priorities here and there. That's, that's the first thing just to talk about. Second important element I would like to talk about and go a bit about it is the situation in the Middle East today. I think we are going through three different wars in the Middle East. One is a regional Cold War, reminiscent of the 60s, but much more difficult than the 60s. There is a Cold War now between an Iranian-led group or and a pan-Arab, sub-Arab, not all Arabs necessarily, but most Arab countries, backed to a certain extent by the US, other group. There is a Cold War going on in the region. Unfortunately, sometimes that's called a spade a spade. Sectarianism is advancing in the region. I spoke in many conferences about what I call the Kerbala paradigm, that we are reviving old history, bringing it like the 30 years war in Europe, we are having care. Let's call a spade a spade. The one who's coming, a third generation Tunisian from Europe or from Morocco, coming to fight in Syria, and a Pakistani coming to fight in Syria, one is Sunni, the other is Shia, are not coming to fight to have a democratic Syria or a socialistic Syria or a state interventionist or neoliberal Syria. They are fighting in the name of God, in the name of the same God. So it repeats itself everywhere. We've seen it elsewhere. But this is the kind of thing. So basically, one is this strong Cold War. Second one, we are having a regional civil war, as I mentioned. Those who are fighting are not necessarily from the country where the fighting is going on. They come from different places. Most of those who are fighting in Syria are not Syrians, mostly. So that's another thing. In Yemen, the same thing. I could say sometimes in Iraq. I could say sometimes going into Libya. So basically, this... Cold War has led also to a sort of regional civil war. And in that respect, we could see today that in most hot spots, hot conflicts, Syria, Libya, Yemen at least, and some others falling back into it, what we could see today are the, the, same, the, the very simple factor that non-state actors are more important than states. Transnational non-state actors are more important than states in conducting the fight on behalf of certain states supporting certain states, but they are on the ground, conducting the fight on the ground, and most of them are non-state actors, basically, on the two sides of the equation. So that's the three levels that feed into each other. You had hot spots. If you look at Syria, for instance, which is, I call it, the conflict of all conflicts, Syria, six months after the implosion in Syria, it was hijacked by fight over Syria. The fight in Syria turned over into a fight. It's very attractive. That's unfortunately the price you pay for that kind of attractiveness, that you're very attractive geopolitically speaking, and everybody would come in to fight into that. Those who are fighting the regime, I don't think they're fighting because of lack of democracy, <laughs> the regime, or because they want to have uh, certain rights in Syria that like them. And those who are fighting against or supporting the regime for the same reason. So basically, it turned into a fight over Syria. And very briefly, what I, why I'm saying about Syria, because Lebanon now has become annexed in this strategic theater of operation to Syria. You had a building of many conflicting levels in Syria. The domestic one, of course, is the least important one. The least important one is the domestic one, unfortunately. Then you had, at one point of time, what I call the confrontation between two returning empires the Ottoman through Turkey and the Persian through Iran. This is a fight. Now they are together in the same bed with the, with the, you know, with the Astana process, but at least there is that matter. Because Syria for Turkey is the door to the Middle East, and for Iran, Syria is the bridge to the Mediterranean. So basically this is a fight between two strategic functions. And why I'm saying this impacts heavily on Lebanon and part of the Lebanese are fighting on this side and some other part on fighting on the other side. Then you have the Arab-Iranian conflict and then you have the Western conflict with, the, with, with the Iran and the Russian-American confrontation, so to speak. So basically, I'm dwelling on Syria because at the end of the day, what we could see today in Lebanon, at one point of time, the Lebanese felt now they are on the side of the equation. They are relieved because the big cake is called Syria. And everybody forgot about the little cake. This will be a prize that the one who will, win, who will get the big cake will have the little cake. But today, the strategic theater of Syria, the operational strategic theater of Syria around Damascus extends from, from B to B, from Baghdad to Beirut. We could see some of the fight, some of the attacks in Iraq 
are produced by fighting within that theater, and some of what's happening in Lebanon too, to a certain extent, is due to that matter, whether it's the Israelis or the Iranians or anybody else, that's now an integrated theater of operation, strategic theater of operation, and we all know the history, God bless his soul, Patrick Seal used to remind us that Syria is like Germany, he who controls Syria, Jamil, you remember, we used to meet with him in Tunis and discuss with Patrick Seal, and he will tell us these stories. He who controls Syria will, talk to, will control the Middle East. Whoever is sitting in Damascus will have the upper hand in the Middle East. So here the problem of Lebanon, its vulnerability, its invitation for, its invitation, it invites intervention and interference, it begs for intervention and interference by different non-state actors, non-state Lebanese actors, which render the situation extremely complex and complicated and tense as it is today. So today what we could see happening, the fight over Syria has increased the fight in Lebanon. And the split today in Lebanon, those who are saying there is a conspiracy someplace to abuse of this situation, which we'll talk about it in a minute, of this Lebanese 100% socioeconomic intifada that somebody is trying to hijack it this way or that way. When you accuse somebody is politicizing it, I mean, you are looking into the mirror because everybody is politicizing everybody, everything else. That's first, the two parties. Second, of course, you're politicizing it and you're externalizing its politicization for the sake or on behalf of certain powers that you support or supports you or you want to be in the good book of that power. So this renders the situation extremely complex and complicated. The problem today with Lebanon, let this intifada, and I insist on the word intifada. I've labeled it as the WhatsApp intifada. It has something fascinating. I consider a rebirth of a certain Lebanese nationalism that didn't exist but in the books at one point of time. And it might be derailed, let me start by the end, but it'll never be destroyed. Why? Because the legitimate sources are structural and legitimate. The basic sources, the structural and legitimate. It is in all regions, through all communities, and all political affiliations. That's 100%. Some people were advised to calm down. I'm using a very diplomatic term. But it didn't mean the issue has been settled. Why? Because there is a strong economic crisis. Let me give you just a couple of numbers, for instance. You know, currently, just very simply, very simply, the public debt per the GDP in Lebanon this year will be 152%. 190 this year. That will end up, some would say it will go to 10%. The unemployment rate, and these are the statistics now, which I'll mention in a second, of two years back, now it's worse. Among youngsters up to 25 year old, somebody new in the market, somebody who's his family invested in him or her, is about 37%. Some will take it to 40%. So basically, that, that's, that's a structural problem. Now, if you earn a degree, it's the first step to get a visa and try to leave the country. I'm a university professor and I see how the student uh, uh, react. So what we're suggesting here is how to cut down these matters. The government, which resigned, presented some ideas. Some ideas, I will go over them if you want in a bit. Some could be addressed immediately. Some others are, we are asking, why, didn't, why weren't they done before, for instance? And some others too, why, how, or how can you do them? For instance, very simply, putting a tax on banks' profits for the next year's budget of 1%. Why didn't you do it before? Asking banks to cut on the very lavish interest rate, which is a Lebanese pound. All that will save us next year if it works well, and it could work well, and it should work well, $3.4 billion. Why did we do it before? Why did we, why this money? Most of our you know, borrowing is in Lebanese pound and goes to the bank with interest rate that, has, that are unacceptable. Why I pay a tax and the bank doesn't pay a tax on this gains? That's one. Second, cutting, trimming some of what you call the councils, al-majalis, administrative councils. If you say I'm cutting the budget of 70%, goodness gracious, if you just, by reacting to pressure, you can cut 70%, it means 
This 70% has no meaning. I'm just quoting you, not quoting myself. That why were you spending that 70%? And so on, and so to speak, and many things. Bringing down the deficit for the year 2020 to 0.6% of the budget. Now it is 9.2. We expect, I pray that it won't be the case, that by December it will be 10%. How could we bring it? By this, okay, this year by just putting taxes and doing that on banks. But you don't have sources at the basis, structural sources that could create the situation. So you're not addressing it. Uh, just dissolving the Ministry of Information. Why didn't you do it before? And so on and so to speak. What is happening today in Lebanon is the fact that the World Bank warned us three years back, warned us three years back, that the economic social model, when the World Bank tells a country, is not functional and cannot function, it means that it meant that we have to review it. We have 30 to 33% living by the poverty line and under the poverty line in Lebanon. Don't go to only to the heart of Beirut, go around Beirut. We don't have any more a middle class, it's breaking down. Some would say on, on prend l'ascenseur, we apprend le descenseur. It's not the ascenseur, the elevator, just the opposite of the elevator. I don't know the word in English. Forgive my French inclination, but it's, we're going down, basically. There is no more middle class in Lebanon. It's breaking down in Lebanon. So what to do? So this has led to this national, trans-communitarian, trans-political, trans-regional reaction. What we're seeing today is, at the beginning, everybody agreed that its causes are autonomous. So it was not hijacked by the sectarian, feudal leadership of Lebanon. Now it, has, it, it starts to being hijacked, because some is accusing the other of using it. If you accuse somebody else of trying to use this, that's one more reason why you should address the deep roots of this problem, not to let anybody else use it. Otherwise, anybody could use it. And those who are accusing the others of using it, want to maintain the statu quo because it's profitable for them, strategically and politically, for non-Lebanese reasons. I repeat myself, for non-Lebanese reasons, that we want the stability in this, you know, Syrian theater of operation to be able to fight better, particularly Hezbollah and others. You cannot use politics a la carte. For me, it's po su suitable, politically speaking, but you, you are politicizing it. If I want to go your way, try to address the causes that allow for politicization. So what you're doing now, trying to sectarianize it or use heavy-handed matter, does not address the real problem. The real problem is getting worse. These medicine that are suggested in the government matter, for instance, the privatization, the PPP privatization, private-public partnership, it cannot be done in two months without being an economist. The, the, you know, at least we say it's a year and a half. We need a year. So basically, we're not out of the kitchen, and we're still feeling the heat of the kitchen. Having said so, we are going into two things. First, we are going into the strategic confrontation now. Lebanon is getting back into becoming more hostage to the confrontation because some factions feel that the statu quo that was profitable to them at the regional level is being weakened by those who want to break it down, whether it's true or wrong, but this is what's happening today. So we are going to a strategic politicization, meaning external, without addressing the key internal factor behind these problems in the country, which will take us where? To a possible political crisis, to a possible, I would not exclude, I wouldn't say yes, but to a possible institutional crisis, some would like to revisit the Ta'if Accord, the new distribution of power. This is not the time to do it. Some would like to use the current situation, the current balance of power in the region, which they consider as profitable to Iran at the expense of the others, particularly in the Syrian context at that stage, to cash on it here and there. Again, it's also a very risky matter, as it's risky if the other party would think that we could now conduct a total change through the you know, legitimate demands of the public. So basically, the root causes will remain there, they are being aggravated over time because they are structural causes and as much as you try to sectarianize in the name of great and important strategic identity-based appeals because it's all based on identity, sub-national and transnational, sectarian, religious and other identity, you are not addressing the real causes. 
you are just trying to manage them and they could explode if not tomorrow, after tomorrow. And we're back, unfortunately, we are on the way of being back to square one. Though I believe that this bread antifada, this thing is there. And it reminds me of what Clinton, President Clinton said to President Bush, it's the economy stupid. And that's what we should say to the political establishment. It's the economy guys. The problem here, even if somebody try to abuse or use of it, of course, if this is the case, it's one more reason why should, why should you address the sources of it. And the sources, the key sources are not addressed. We are still a very neoliberal kind of economy that cannot function as that forever. We need to invest, for instance, certain sectors. The advice was to invest in agriculture and in industrial industrialization, small industrialization, for two important reasons. For ecological balance, for regional balance and for intersectorial balance, for people to stay where they are. And it doesn't take much money. I mean, I could give you figures. It doesn't take much money if you subsidize through you know, small enterprises, middle enterprises by creating that, through mini credits, the creation of little industries, food-based industries. But the whole thing is still around the tertiary sector, which was always the case of Lebanon, as I'm saying. I mean. Uh, which is you know, the service sector and the banking sector, but you cannot live on it, particularly with the young demography in Lebanon, which is pushing everybody outside uh, the country. I think I would try to stop here. I didn't abuse of my time, and uh, I'd be more than happy to clarify and to go deeper into any point and perhaps other point. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nasif, for this uh, um, comprehensive uh, talk and uh, this comprehensive review of the situation in Lebanon uh, and of Lebanon in, uh, in, in the region. Uh, let me just uh, use my privilege as, as moderator and raise a couple of questions to you, but I would like you to also please explain the succession of the Lebanese Constitution, 1926, the Wafaq al-Watani, the National Accord, 1943, and then Al-Taif, 1989. So, uh, so, because I think this may explain a lot of, um, of the sectarianism or communitarianism, if you wish, uh, that uh, characterizes uh, the um, uh, Lebanese state. You, you, you have talked about existence of Lebanese foreign policies, and then you talked about Lebanese society. In fact, I think there are several Lebanese societies. So, uh, and societies, and because in fact, you cannot really have foreign policies if you don't have different societies, you don't have a state. Uh, you have said that the state is almost non-existent, and we have seen this in the uh, recent uh, uh, refugee crisis policies were policies of communities and not really of... of um, so uh, I'd like you to, to, to comment on this. And then you talked about the primordial role of non-state actors. Right? And I think this is a very interesting and very important observation. Uh, non-state actors have become, in fact, more important than states. Doesn't this really mean that we are before the failure of the regional state system that has come about after World War I. Uh, aren't these uprisings in Iraq, the destruction of Syria, uprising in Lebanon, uh, 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 a sorry economic situation in Jordan, situation in, in Palestine, aren't all these expressions of a catastrophic state of the system? Can the system really survive? Uh, and I think Lebanon was in the heart of the system. Uh, probably the system would not have existed before, uh, 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 without Lebanon. So if Lebanon is in such a crisis, and if economic policies are needed to straighten up the situation, but I think that sectarianism in Lebanon uh, is so entrenched that it is an obstacle to rational economic policies. You cannot have allocations uh, uh, 
uh, in economic policy where allocations go to supposedly what they should go, when you have sectarianism and you have priorities based on sectarianism. So where are we going? Is there any, is there any, any, any horizon uh, for what is going on? Is, is, is it possible that we'll find a solution or will it only be an uprising and then unfortunately things will calm down and then uh, we will be back to where uh, we were at, uh, at the beginning? Uh, I think that uh, these really are uh, my observations. So I would like to, 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 to please react, but again to start please by this succession of the, of the fundamental uh, agreements uh, in the Lebanese political system. And probably to start with the, with the creation of Lebanon itself, Le Grand Liban. Well, the idea of Grand Liban will be celebrating uh, the 100th yes. anniversary, yes. Uh, 2020. The idea, you know, at that time, when the Maronite Patriarch was negotiating in France, the idea was to have ma Christian majority, so, but at the expense of economics, demography or economics. So we enlarge into the heartland, which was the Beka region. Trablos, Tripoli, a city called Trablos Sham, it used to be called, Trablos, Syria. So the idea in redrawing, in redrawing the map in the Middle East. Yes, yes, well, with all the respect to Trablos al Gharb in Libya, but our Trablos comes, 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 yes, yes, of course. Tripoli, the second city in Lebanon. So, so the idea was to extend, to go into larger demographics, rebalance the sectarian balance of power, Christian Muslims, for the reason of having a plausible country to, to survive. And this comes later on, the National Pact of 43, basically. The National Pact, which was criticized one time by the late uh, Lebanese journalist called uh, Georges Naash, Florian Lejour, he said, Denégations ne font pas une nation. Two negations don't make a nation. I refrain from become, being part of the West culturally for more Christian majority. It's not all Christian or all Muslims, by the way, when we say that. And one of the things, the strongest Arab nationalist leadership was, were Christians in Lebanon, by the way. So basically, it's not Muslim versus Christians, Christians versus Muslim. I mean, this is something extremely simplistic. We were talking about it, you and I, before in the Middle East. Second point, as the Arab, the Muslims, refraining, at that time Muslims, not Sunni Shias, so, refraining from wanting Arab unity, merging, uh, 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 unity, basically. So refraining from these two. The negation of foundation. The national pact was there, that we construct Lebanon, and the priority, the primacy, was to the president. It was a sort of semi-presidential system. The president was Maronite, to be Maronite. Not in the constitution, but to be Maronite, basically. So that was how it functions. Now, we profited in that period of two important things. Very vibrant society, very high level of education. Remember, you had two important universities, not only for Lebanon, for the Arab world, American University in Beirut and the University of Saint Joseph, but basically the AUB. So, and we profited, unfortunately, from the problems of our neighbors. The creation of Israel has sent the Palestinian elite into, into Lebanon. The beginning of, you know, nationalization in Syria and in Iraq has sent the rich people, you see the, Aleppo bourgeoisie would settle in Beirut, basically, in Lebanon. The Hama bourgeoisie, the Damascus, I insist on bourgeoisie, would settle there with money. It was an extremely neoliberal economic system, and always it was a neoliberal economic system. And as, as I was quoting before, telling you about our professor, he used to say, we have too much liberty, but too little democracy. You can talk about anything, there is no sacred cow, but doesn't mean it's democratic at the end of, in terms of the system, how it's working. So the beginning of the system, the national pact was based on these two negations. I'm not westernized, and I don't want an Arab merger. But that was not enough, because we would see, for instance, when the Palestinian revolution took southern Lebanon as a basis of it entirely, it became a state within a state. And in Cairo, 69 here, an agreement was signed which was considered yeah, any abnormal by any student of statehood. Lebanon relinquishing part of sovereignty to a revolution on its territory, basically, because it was a way of avoiding war, or as the late Fouad Boutros, the great minister of foreign affairs, he said we had two chances, not to sign and to start an immediate civil war, 
or to sign and wait for a couple of years after for the civil war. So you had a Palestinian revolution acting from within a state. Now, without going into, you know, Muzayadat, as we say in Arabic, no state would accept that situation. Lebanon was a supporting state, not a confrontation state. Dawlat Musanada, Walaysa Dawlat Muwajaha. But in reality, we were the only confrontation state. Not even a bullet would be shot from Syria, for instance, our neighbors, you know, when everybody was fighting via Lebanon. So this weakness, why? Because of this communitarism. Basically, the weakness of the state. But we profited, as I mentioned, even during the civil war that happened in Lebanon. The opening, the, the oil revolution, allowed Lebanese to go and work in the Gulf. So interesting enough, at the time when you consider the country should have become a failed state, not even a failing state, Lebanese grew richer. Why? Because they are Arabs, they speak the language, and you have a high level of education, so they would go and, and work in the Gulf. But over time, the demographics have changed in Lebanon in terms of Christian versus Muslims. And we are still thinking, unfortunately, not in the concept of citizenship, but in the concept of religious uh, uh, politics, unfortunately, not of a civil state. This is what I will reserve to the end as a solution for Lebanon. And if you think in these terms, basically, then you have to review the situation. And that has pushed to come to the Ta'if agreement to accompany the process with Lakhdar al-Brahimi, you would remember, 89. The three countries that were entrusted to that matter, Algeria and Morocco being far away but important, plus Saudi Arabia brought, as you know, in Ta'if, and the Lebanese parliamentarian decided to re-establish to re-establish the balance of power, whereas now the executive power was entrusted in the Council of Ministers that could be headed by the president if he wants, or by the prime minister if the president doesn't want. But decisions are there, it's no more in the president. So the executive now was the Council of Ministers, and so on. So this redressed the balance, and we moved from six to five in terms of representation, six to Christians, to five Muslims in parliament, to six to six to respect the demographics, but also the economic changes, so on, so on, to speak. And that's the formula that tomorrow, the fourth of this month, we celebrate the 30th anniversary, 89, I think, the 30th anniversary of it, basically. But this system, based on a de facto federalism of sectarian political leadership, forget about what's in the Constitution, where each one would have a veto power. If you attack me because of economics, you are attacking the community. No, I'm attacking you as a person, as a minister, as a prime minister, as a speaker of the house, as a president. So everything will be communitarized and everybody would agree on that without saying it publicly, which installed a system of stalemate, a total stalemate. Gone were the days where the Gulf is open, it's no more the case. Gone are the days where it was easy to emigrate in Africa because our immigration were in Latin America and Africa, late 19th century and 20th century. So basically, you find yourself at home with a system that at one point of time, you know, from post-Taif, when Taif was decided and was put the system in the very early 90s, the Syrians were entrusted with running the show. They were, allow me to use the term, subcontracted by the regional international orders to run Lebanon to run the show, basically. So this subcontract later on, the Lebanese or part were fed up with it, 2005. We went back to a competition. And that competition happened at a moment when Iran grew very strong, very strong in the region, when the, uh, the Arab were entirely disappeared from the scenery. I mean, I, in many conferences, I described the first decade of the 21st century as a decade of the dis-Arabization of the Arab regional order. The dis-Arabization of the Arab regional order. We didn't have a locomotive in the Arab world. We lived for years with a sort of understanding, not necessarily agreement, understanding between three main powers, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and Syria. And that was the locomotive of the Arab regional order. This locomotive broke down for many reasons in the first decade of the century, leading to the dis-Arabization, I'm talking in terms of political strategic terms, and the revival or the return of two empires with a great appetite in the region, using Islamism, which replaced Arabism as the attractive ideology, turning into sectarism after a certain moment with Iran and with Turkey. So this is an important matter to look at, and Lebanon became, as I'm telling you, the area, because it's very vulnerable, back to the bipolarization among the different communities, and within the sects. You had first Muslim Christians, it became after Sunni Shia, political Sunnism, I mean, 
political Shiism, not religion in terms of belief in that matter, as we could see uh, uh, today happening, particularly when Prime Minister Hariri was assassinated. Some people <laughs> thought that we could come back to normalcy because of this reaction to the assassination of Hariri, but we didn't go back to normalcy. So Ta'if, Ta'if is a step that should lead later on to the creation of a civil state. We don't call it a secular state because it upsets some people. It's a civil state, Dawla Madaniya, over time. So we will have a deconfessionalized parliament, a non-sectarianized parliament, and a house of senate or a senate, Majlis Shuyukh, which will represent the different communities. We didn't go into that. Second important matter, strategic matter that impacted on Lebanon because of that matter and led it to its breakdown, the fragility of Taif needed to be consolidated at the national level, which was not. No, no social contract and no national integration. We were still running a federation of sectarian leadership. The country is run by a federation of sectarian leadership. Let's call a spade a spade. I'm not talking about the constitutional aspect. But with the upper hand of Syria, and when Syria left, it was the upper hand of Iran. Why? Because as it happened in Iraq, at one point of time, the disappearance of an Arab projection of power in the region, leaving Iraq to the Iranians, post -total. considering all Shias as Iranians, which is entirely, I'm sorry, stupid, allow me to say, a non-diplomatic term, because there are more Arabs than anybody else in Iraq. The same about Lebanon, leaving it to Iran. Basically, so at the end of the day, those who decide the questions of war and peace in Lebanon is Hezbollah, basically. So at the end of the day, the decision is there. You would remember in 2006, I'm sorry to go in details, Hezbollah admitted publicly, they had the courage to admit that we made a mistake because we thought the rules of the game that existed before Israeli withdrawal in 2000 are still there. And that they are not no more there, so we make a step according to these old rules of the game of engagement, and they have changed, and we made a mistake. Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah said it publicly on television. Basically, but the true control of the situation is like that. There is a total, my dear friend, there is a total unbalanced situation in Lebanon and in Syria around this matter. This is why I think what is needed are two things. In the Arab world, we need a new social contract for most of our states, a new social contract, and also you need a revival of a certain form of cooperation in the Arab world. You need at the state level which has disappeared entirely. As I say, I go back to what I said, there is a disarabization of the Arab regional order. We are a theater of confrontation of non-Arab regional powers and of international powers with and without. Last point, look at Syria, for instance. Yani, what is the Arab role in Syria? Today, the Troika of Russia, which is a maestro, Turkey and Iran, through the Astana process, or call it the Tsotchi process, I prefer the Astana process, are calling the shots. Geneva is a sort of protocol format, with all the respect, no more. But where are the Arabs in this? Where are the Arabs' interests in Syria? I won't talk to the Iranians. I'm not saying to go and back the Iranians. The, the Turks are, are doing business with the Iranians. And so basically what you need to do here is to have a different, really, approach which I found difficult now to create. I'm just analyzing. I'm not saying it's going to happen about that matter. Lebanon is more vulnerable, as I'm saying, because the state is extremely weak, extremely divided, based on a system of vetoes, of internal vetoes that are activated from the outside without impacting from the outside. You go and ask to be activated from, from the outside, and this is where we are today. This is why I'm not particularly really optimistic about really turning the page now. Thank you very much, Nassif. So we'll open the floor. Any questions, any comments you may have? Dr. Sika? I would, um, I'm really interested in uh, understanding the sectarianism uh, or actually the anti sectarianism that's going on now. So, the you said. Anti-sectarianism. Uh, Anti-sectarianism. Yes. So um, I see that. So we look at if we look at Iraq and uh, Lebanon, we see that actually the uh, anti-sectarianism is on the rise, and the reason why people are on the streets is because of that. So how would we um, look at this today, or how can we explain uh, what would come next? Is really uh, the sectarian politics that's uh, entrenched in Iraq and Lebanon going to end? 
or uh, are we going to see different uh, things playing out? Yes. Uh, I think that... Let's, uh, let's take a couple of questions, or three questions, and then we have... A, so... Uh. Thank you very much for the remarks. Very interesting. It's, it's the same in line with, especially for instance, with the recent uh, electoral events and, and like the rise of the results for uh, Beirut Madinati, for instance, and, and the results that caused in, 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 in election events where we see this sort of movement more towards like less sectarianism or anti-sectarianism and like more towards like more secular civil state rather than like the state where all actors are involved as you just mentioned. Any other question? Yes. yes. Um, thank you so much. Um, my question is also in addition to the sectarianism issue. Uh, you mentioned a very interesting sentence in your presentation that these, uh, the uprisings in Lebanon or the protests can be uh, a birth of a Lebanese um, nationalism. In Iraq, um, and there are many comparisons between Iraq and Lebanon, but um, some people say that in Iraq there was a base um, to a national identity that existed probably during the Ba'athist party, there was a, an Iraqi national identity despite the sectarian system. But in Lebanon, this was missing since the, the creation of the state. So how, how, how do you see the future of this movement sustaining itself given that in the past there were no previous experiences of a Lebanese like national identity? Thank you. Yeah, let me put the questions together and <clears throat> because it will address it. The problem in the Mashrek and the Levant and in that part of the, of the, uh, and the Gulf to a certain extent, the states were new creations, lines drawn in the sand to a certain extent. At one point of time, you had secular ideologies, all forms of panisms, pan-Arabism, pan-Syrianism, greater Syria, pan-Lebanonism, pan-Syrianism. The failure of these ideologies because they were hijacked by certain people and used and abused of and the, fail, and, and the revival of religious ideologies, sectarian ideologies, in mosaic societies. And the mosaic society is a sign of richness. Diversity, unity and diversity is a sign of richness, has created cracks in the states. The, these countries did not produce a social contract, a socio-national contract of concept of citizenship. It was imposed from above, but not creating that. So with the rise of these, Identité meurtrière, as our friend uh, would say, uh, Amin Ma'louf. You know, destructive, killing identities. Why they were, it's not a conspiracy, because the national identity was not there. If I'm governing, I'm using national identity. If not, I'm using my subnational identity. If you go and look at Iraq before addressing sectarianism, when the war happened in 2003, the Americans, on purpose or not on purpose, I don't go into conspiratorial theory, I prefer stupid theory, whatever it is, offered, Iraq on a golden platter to the Iranians. The Arab countries didn't deal with Iraq. They considered that all Shias, most Arab countries, are Iranians, which is not the case. They, they, these are, there is a strong Iraqi nationalism in Iraq. And these guys were fighting Iran at the height of the Iraq-Iran war. So basically, if you start considering anybody who is not of your community as of the opposite, you are playing into the hands of the opposite. <laughs> so there was no attempt at national construction. So basically, by hook, by, by ideology, to a certain extent, with the rise of these sub-national with transnational solidarities, ideologies, sectarian ideologies, ethnic ideologies, due to the failure of national construction in the first place, on one hand, and second, the fear of the others and the withdrawal has led to what I call this sectarian confrontation, which happened, if not on the territory, in the minds of people. The sectarianization, a very strong dose. In Lebanon, opposite to it, it was an organized sectarism. So there was no fight in the past. In the past, if you're fighting, you're fighting politically in the evening, you're together, of having two more seats here and two less seats there in the parliament or, or something. But the fact that the country is vulnerable to these kind of interventions and interference has led to that matter. Addressing the sectarian problem cannot be done in 24 hours, but you can never have national integration if you don't address sectarianism as its basis. This is why Ad-Dawla al madaniyya the civil state, which is not anti-religion, as some would say, 
You could be a strong believer, a fanatic believer, and live in a civil state. But here, it's, you cannot say, my religion is the one that has to be implemented. The mashrik is not like that. The mashrik is based on diversity, basically. So that's the reason why sectarianism is a cancer. And it's becoming more cancerous now in the region because it's becoming the basic identity. People are fighting in the name of communities. Forget about the facade that you say. Solidarity, sociological solidarities are based on that matter. So this is the reason why sectarianism is expanding. This would, to a certain extent, currently cannot entirely contain and destroy this new, I call it non-sectarian, national, secular uprising. Why? Because it's based on something very concrete, which is what? Bread and butter and the ceiling, saf, and job. So this unifies everybody. You might, at a certain point, uh, uh, derail it for some community by force, by conviction, but you cannot destroy it at the end of the day. So this is the fight today between these two dynamics. One is retreating of total sectarianization, even of the society, political sectarianization of the society, imposed by the system, and at the same time, this upheaval, you talk Beirut, Medina, and so on and so to speak, who are saying you can be a believer, it doesn't matter, Christian, Muslim, but we are talking in the civil space, Majal al Madani, of constructing a state from zero. This is the name of the game currently in Lebanon as well. If you look at Syria, why there was a disturbance in the fight? Because those who have come to fight the regime were raising slogans, religious slogans, that at least 30% or 40% of Syrians cannot adopt because they are not Sunnis. Let me call it spade a spade. It doesn't work like that. So if you come wanting to implement your religious view, for instance, it cannot go in diversified religiously and sectarian diversified society, basically. This played in the hand of the regime to a certain extent, plus other, of course, external factors and regional and international factors, external at the both levels. So basically, I think the way out is to go to a new social contract. But the social contract is not only a socioeconomic contract, it's a national contract based on identity, on a civil state. What we see in Lebanon, is extremely important. It's not for tomorrow, it's there. Ta'if agreement talks about that. Talks that the first phase, for instance, concerning the distribution of you know, government post, only for the first rate post, it's based on six to six, one to one. Below that, no, it's not like that. It's not. I was a member of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs committee, which did an exam to, to take 26 new diplomats. We never looked at the community who had more girls than boys, and it happened that we were more Christian than Muslims, that you don't see the names anyway, so basically. But the higher post. So this is a first step, but you cannot go out and really attack the sources of national vulnerability unless you desectorianize the system. It's not for tomorrow, but the process has been launched, being in Beirut or in Baghdad. Second round, yes, please. Mike. Thank you very much for your, for your rich comments. Uh, I just have a quick question about the issue of alternatives. Some of the slogans that have been said throughout the protests were like Kellon Yani Kellon or the people need the collapse of the regime. Those are some of the slogans that we've heard. Yes. Uh, all is all. Exactly, all is all, if we, if we can put it in English. Uh, What's, what is the actual alternative, if I can say? Like, uh, apparently there are, uh, all parties or all political groups are based on, <coughs> on, yes, there are different political agendas, but they are religiously divided. And apparently we haven't seen uh, a, 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 a political entity or a political party coming out of those protests. So, and now Hari's government is out. So what do you think can be the alternative and whether the, the existing political forces can can possibly change their, their, their mindsets and implement the demands of the protesters in, in the future. Is that possible or not? Someone else? Asif, yes. I don't think that the consociational model will break down tomorrow. Uh, I'm sorry to say this way, funny enough, some considered Lebanon as the model to be emulated in Iraq
and in Yemen. It doesn't have to be a religious community. It could be, you know, uh, ethnic communities or regional communities as power sharing. But this is a model like, you know, uh, uh, Churchill was quoted, democracy is the worst of all systems except for the others. That in the Arab world today, if you want to adopt this model, it should be a transitional model with a commitment to moving to a civil state, to a desectorized state. It could be a way out at a certain, but the fear is that those who are in power across the board, even if they attack the others, they'll be attacking themselves as if they are looking in the mirror about that. You are sectarian, I'm sectarian. I mean, my power base is sectarian. Why am I? So basically, this is a dynamics now. If you want to progress because of socioeconomic reasons, not because of ideological reasons, you have to start, I'm talking about the systems, relinquish some of your power on that matter. But it's at the end of the day, it's a matter of confrontation between those who want to have a civil state and those who are committed to maintaining this sectarian system, regardless of what you call it. Because in Iraq, it's a sectarian, it's a non-constitutionalized system, but it's much more uh, uh, sectarianized than it is in Lebanon, and unbalanced than it is in Lebanon, basically. So basically, you have to go around that. Tomorrow in Yemen, you, if, you, if you substitute the community, religious community, by a tribal community or a regional community, you move into the same thing, unless and until you move to the sound set of citizenship that is equal regardless of your communal, sectarian, religious, regional, or tribal, if it's a tribal society belonging. It's a long way out, but of course, the fight is an uphill struggle fight, it's not easy, particularly that geopolitical considerations comes and impinge. Look, for instance, at what's happening in Lebanon, when Hezbollah would say, no way that to, to change, no way to do this and that and that and that, and the others are politicizing. Yes, but you are politicizing. If you want to maintain a statu quo, you are, you are politicizing what's suitable for you, and the others are politicizing. You're speaking the same language, but even if you speak the same language, does not mean that at the basis the problem is socioeconomic. The same about Iraq. About Iraq, it's the regions, the Shia regions, which are suffering the most, which are supposedly are in power or are represented in power with the change of a regime. I mean, the great danger in the Arab world is this sectarianization of the political space. We are experts, unfortunately, in Lebanon about the danger of such model. It's something that needs to be revisited every now and then by expanding demographies or expanding economics or being uh, uh, more attractive to regional and other allies. If you look at Lebanon, just a last point on that, those who criticize Syria, everybody has been allied with Syria at one point of time in Lebanon. I would love to see one party in Lebanon pretending that it was not allied with Syria, not to say more than that in Lebanon. Everybody, even the staunch party <laughs> opposite to Syria today have been to Damascus e eating ice cream and Baghdad because at that time, their friends wanting them to go and eat ice cream. Back then. By the way, it's a great ice cream, Baghdad ice cream. <laughs> it used to be. Halas. We live in the past. So basically, which is to suggest that at one point of time, at the end of the day, it's your extra national alliances that ask you, I'm using a very diplomatic term, my, my deformation diplomatique, that will tell you do this and do that, basically. So these regimes invite begs, interference, and intervention when you're split along these lines. Ambassador Ramzi, Mike here. Thank you very much, Nassif. Uh, I think everybody in this room agrees with you that confessional politics is a plague in Syria, in uh, Lebanon. And the way, of course, is to build a, a civil uh, uh, state in, Syria, in Lebanon and elsewhere in, in this region. But as you say, it is something that is not within reach in the foreseeable future. But we, maybe we've seen, we're seeing right now some indications in Lebanon and in Iraq in that direction. Now, the issue is, given the situation in Lebanon today, how do you see what steps can be taken towards achieving this goal, although it might take some time? Especially that, and you made it, you made it very clear, that Lebanon invites outside intervention. Lebanon is, has been a victim of outside intervention from different uh, quarters. 
And it is also at the same time strategically linked to Syria and the situation in Syria, as you know, remains unclear. The agendas have shifted and they have not settled in a particular place. And unless Syria, a solution or a settlement is found in Syria, how will that affect Lebanon at this point? Thank you. Yes. It's great to see you back in, Asif. Um, could I ask you to go also into um, heli helicopter view and, and look at the region from the perspective of uh, uh, this being 100 years since Versailles, since the end of the Ottoman Empire. Um, you say 30 years since Taif, but it's also 30 years since the wall came down and the, the US emerged as the lone superpower on the world stage. And, uh, somehow you could say that what we're seeing now is the both to some degree the end of the Versailles system in, in the region, or at least in the Levant, and, and the end of the US as the successor power hegemon in, in the region, uh, 100 years of, of successors to the Ottomans. Um, if, if that is the case, what, what does the future, uh, what, what, what lies in, in, in in the future for us. Much more trouble, I, I guess, and much, a much messier situation. And you invoked the 30 years of war in, in, in Europe, which was both states, uh, non-state sectarianism, representatives of the Catholic Church, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, is, that, is that the scenario that you're seeing for the unforeseeable future? Okay, I'll take, I'll take two. For, for, for Lebanon, I think uh, some would say the, eggs, the egg first or the chicken first. Should we move to a situation where there is a total desectarianization at the societal level to move to a civil society, as the Taif calls, Dawla al Madaniya? Or should we start now? I think we should start now, bearing in mind that it's not done in 24 hours. Any. Certain things could be done very easily to move along that is the desectarianization of the parliament. You elect the parliament on the basis of political parties, not sects, but you will tell me now that there is a majority that has a, you know, a sort of theological totalitarian call that it force itself by the number. But this is something that I'm raising. If you wait, you wait till when, but the system is enforcing itself, basically, but you have to profit from that. Second matter that you could do, and I will answer them, is to establish a balance with the creation of the Senate. The Senate is along sectarian lines, and in certain issues like in systems bicameral, you would have the two that will balance each other on certain issues. But you have to start desectarianize the parliament, but also you have to work at the educational and cultural level to do that. It's not by just clicking and saying, Lebanon, one you know, constituency for electoral matters, where you have some parties that mobilizes along sectarian line and others cannot. But the beginning, like you mentioned about Beirut, Medina, and, and other things, there is a change coming. So you, I, personally, you have to start. You have to start unless by unlocking, starting by unlocking. Second matter that could count, and we had an experience about it in Lebanon that would in, encourage indirectly but more forcefully desectarianization. I'm sure some of you who know Lebanon, read about Lebanon, the period of Fuad Shahab, President Fuad Shahab in 58, he brought people who are technocrats, but not like we are using the word technocrats, someone who speaks uh, a language that nobody understands, but on behalf of his uh, feudal boss. No, it's someone who speaks a language that you understand, but he understands what he's saying, and he's making choices. For Ajhab made that at the beginning. He brought people, regardless of their religious affiliations, they were clean, they were real technocrats, but you need to develop a plan. What do you have? And for instance, the basic problem, why should we wait for the World Bank to tell us that your economic and social model cannot function. We are too much neoliberal. I mean, Milton Friedman will be a, a, a leftist according to the way the Lebanese system works. Sometimes I'm appalled when some friends say, oh, it's nice, why are you complaining? Look at your hotels. Yes, you have a couple of uh, five-star restaurants in Beirut that you don't find in Champs-Élysées and a couple of nice hotels, but what is it, for 10,000 people? What does it say that? I mean, 
Yeah. So basically, you have to start somewhere, somehow, but you have to start along building what you say, accountability in the state, a state based on institution. And you had for three, almost three years till the coup d'etat against Chab and then the coming of the military in 61, it functioned. You have to have transparency, accountability. You could, you could do it. Plus, starting with this gradual desectarianization process, but the basic matter here, the basic matter, I think the matter that cannot wait is to have a different model of economic production in Lebanon. We're talking about that matter. You have to focus on agriculture and small industries. And this we can do something. Why? For, a very, for people to stay where they are. For people, we had two years ago, it's a little story, but it's very indicative. When we could not export our apples because of the borders closed, and you know, just producers were throwing the apples up. The issue is not doing that. The issue: Why don't you do compote? Why don't you do can, you know, industrialize it, and then you could sell it? We had discussions with our European friends. If we produce at a certain level of exigencies, you could do it. So w the advantage of that: people stay where they are. You have ecological balance. You would have regional balance and demographic balance. Those who know Beirut now, look at the Beirut, how it is you know, over-congested. Plus, yeah, there are many ways to diffuse the tension, the crisis, through a new economic philosophy, through a new socio-economic philosophy. That's not too much neoliberal. I'm not going to socialism, or never had it when socialism was a la mode. But you have to have a more balanced, intersectorial economics through that, plus advancing gradually along these lines, as I am saying, of institutionalization, desectarianization of certain aspects. There will be a, a sort of resistance to it, but when you have that kind of transparency, it worked in the past to a certain extent, you could move along it. It's an uphill struggle, but staying where we are, it means we're going down the drain for 100%. I mean, I bet my life on it. Yeah, trying always to hijack domestic matters into becoming strategic confrontation under sexy, attractive titles. I'm fighting for Palestine. Which Palestine you're fighting for? Why should I not eat three meals a day? And why should 37% of those under 25 don't find a job for, in the name of which Palestine you're talking about? I mean, we're only on people fighting. Others are doing nothing. I mean, for Iranians or others coming to do that. So not to remain only an active, the only active theater of confrontation that's happening there. The issue of Syria, to go back, we cannot get out entirely of the, our problem because we intervene in Syria for ideological, strategic interest reasons. You're the best place to understand what I'm saying that. Syria is a Lebanese domestic matter and you have, to have, you have to understand the psychology of Lebanese Syrian relations that go back to the beginnings, to the birth of the two countries. And for instance, let me give you a simple example. The issue of the Shaba farms now, what to do with them, they are Lebanese. We all know, we spoke to the Syrians, I'm not revealing secrets, during the Madrid conference. They said, guys, don't raise it now because I have to submit the papers to the UN to say, to move it from 242, resolution 242, occupied in 67, to resolution 425 about Lebanon. But if we do it today, we put into question the Tabarayad waters. So we cannot do it. So it's not enough at Tazeki I mean, to play it intelligently. Yeah, if you agree, it's mine. It cannot be mine today and yours tomorrow. I'm just giving an example of the volatility of such strategic issues. So basically, Syria impacts on us. A weak Syria, I might say something that many of my compatriots would not like, is a more problem for us than a strong Syria. <laughs> at least there is a phone number which we can call and, or have somebody call. But here there is nobody to call. And you have to speak Farsi or sometimes Russian. You don't know to whom to talk. I mean, Syria today is like Lebanon with Syria in the past. We had one nanny. They are having two nannies, and they don't know who's coming else, basically. So that's the basic problem. For the Middle East today, my dear friend, I'm happy to, to see after so many, so many years, we are living in an anarchical regional order in the Middle East. And we are not out of it. We might pretend we are out of it. The problem is one aspect, one major, is the state of the state the state of the state. We need a new social contract in most of our states to have legitimate stabilization, stabilization from below, first. Second, we need to review relations in the region. I mean, it's not everything or nothing. It's not everything or nothing. I mean, either, either we don't talk to each other. I suggested, I was talking this morning to a friend, 
an idea which I've raised years back in 2014. Why not having a conference on security and cooperation, like the Helsinki process, putting Israel out because we don't have relations with Israel. It begins, this is an article that it was co-signed with me by uh, Musavian, our Iranian, uh, who was an ambassador at one point of time. He co-signed the article with me. And it was published on Sharr al-Ausa. The idea is to have, does not replace existing institutions. It's like the Helsinki process. We have a conference on security and cooperation where we sit and say, okay guys, we build, we identify common interests, we build on it. Where we differ, we contain. I'm not here to convince you I'm right or you're wrong. I'm not here to, con to tell you your reg regime is not legitimate, mine is legitimate. Uh, yani, this is very important in terms of recognizing states as a states as that. I'm not here to intervene and speaking over your heads, to normalize interstate relations, to disideologize uncertainty. Now, today, you have Iran who speaks, so you have Turkey who come and say you're not a good regime or you're a good regime. How can you come and speak over my head? Yani, you have to normalize state relations. That's the basic conditions. Otherwise, we are in an anarchical order for three reasons, as I mentioned. One is the failed and failing states the number of failing states is extremely dangerous and increasing, sometimes hidden, not so much hidden in the Arab world, producing and reproducing more problems, locally based problems. Second matter, the kind of relations, everything or nothing. Either we, 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 we love each other or we don't talk to each other. There is no gradual approach, no issue based approach. I always give an example. I envy them actually, Turkey and Iran. Today they are good friends, but look a couple of years back when they were at each other back on Syria. They would talk in increasing economic exchange and they do it and both of them, prime ministers and ministers will say we are doing, while we are fighting here, you go by issue areas. You do that instead of everything or nothing. And this reactive Mazeji way of conducting politics in the Arab world must stop. Plus, so first is a domestic challenge of having a new social contract, an inclusive social contract, okay, to build strong legitimacy arising from below, not imposed from above, so to speak, if you can, to develop different kind of relations of cooperation and understanding, not settling problems, containing problems and building on what's common, and three, to address key issues. For instance, Yanni, now it's becoming the forgotten issue, the, the Palestinian issue. Nobody could erase an identity-based issue. You could weaken it, you could shelve it, reshelve it for some time, but you can never kill it. The story of the breakdown of the Soviet Union tells us that. So these are some key issues. Here, if I may go a step further, Yanni, I think Europeans have more interest, because closer to us, in helping in a way in any stabilization process that should be issued and started in the Middle East, which is not the case yet, neither help nor starting from the Middle East. We have a tall agenda, I'm not extremely optimistic, if I may, I don't like to say optimism, pessimism on the short run, but we might going into more and more of an anarchical order. Most of the conflicts are being contained, not settled. Contained, not settled. And when a conflict is contained and not settled, it might erupt a moment when you don't expect it, and it might erupt in a more difficult case. I mean, look at Libya, look at Yemen, Iraq is erupting, look at Lebanon, and of course, the mother of all is Syria. We need some Westphalianism, I was trying to, to say. A, a, a light Westphalianism. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Um, so since the end of the Civil War, Lebanon's, I mean, always kind of been talked about as being on the edge, and now it seems maybe it's truly more on the edge now than it's been before, and the, the problems are more dire. But what's been the, <coughs> I mean, compared to the civil war that Lebanon went through that was so long and so bloody and so vicious, what's been the safeguard that's prevented the state from falling back into a state of civil war, and is that safeguard still there? And what would make it fall if it is? Okay, so I will answer, and then, I'm sorry. Uh, I think two important matters would not take us to civil war. One is what I call the lesson or the capital L learned by everybody, believe me, from the civil war, that you cannot win entirely. Everybody lost, but in different times in, 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 in any way. And second, the existing balance of power would not allow today 
the existing regional balance of power via Lebanon and through Lebanon and Lebanon would not allow for a civil war. And three, if I may add, nobody has an interest. Even our European friends have an interest. Any. Here I would just open parenthesis to talk about the issue of you know, refugees. We call them displaced in Lebanon. Again, that's another issue. Displaced rather than refugees because we are not signatory to the Convention on Refugees. And uh, some Lebanese don't want to think that there are refugees that might stay forever. I mean, the, the psychological matter of it, basically, are all these elements that would work toward containment and minimal stability. But basically, what's in the mind of, of people and the kind of civil war that exploded in the past would not explode because of the different balance of power, but basically because of the uh, uh, lessons learned. But having said so, doesn't mean that we are not progressing if we don't do something along, we, we, we are not standstill. I believe that we, it's an uphill struggle for addressing these socioeconomic problems, but otherwise we're still progressing in a different, depends, speed, depending on the day, as we say, in the process of becoming more and more of a failed or failing state. Nassif, you've raised many issues beyond Lebanon, so I'll... Uh, <laughs> uh, I want to take you to the, uh, the idea of a uh, Helsinki-like process in the Middle East. Uh, there are two problems. Uh, one is, and there, there are many actually, uh, proposals in this regard. There's the Iranian <coughs> proposal, there's the Russian proposal, Jordanians for a while played around with it, and of course, anywhere in Europe, they will always tell you, you need a Helsinki-like process. The issue is, the Iranian proposal, for example, speaks about a Helsinki-like process in the Gulf. Thank you, yeah. Okay. Which means you basically divide the Arab world. Uh, those who advocate a more comprehensive process bring in Israel. And you rightly pointed out, bringing in Israel really undermines this whole process at this stage because you cannot compare the situation in the Middle East now to what it was like uh, in Europe in the late 60s and 70s. So how do you square the circle? I think the mo let me just say one point. I mean, dividing Arab security into Gulf security and Middle East security is extremely dangerous and will not fly. But uh, I'm still, I'd like to have your view on that. Thank you. Amzi, thank you because, uh, Yani, we agree, let me say 100%. Your question is what I've raised. Let me start saying, in one conference in 2014, an Iranian friend raised, colleague raised the issue. It was, you know, it was not sort of second track. I mean, just <laughs> discussing matters. And he raised the issue of Helsinki in the Gulf. My answer, but very friendly, I said, look, we, the Arabs were very weak, but we're not very stupid. I mean, don't take us as stupid. Call it Pax Iranica, one plus one plus six. One plus one, Iran plus Iraq plus a six. It's called Pax Iranica. That's first. So it doesn't work. We cannot go by it. That's one. Second, we cannot admit Israel out of realism. Those who, because you know, when you have to recognize each other to speak, to have diplomatic relations in the first place. Okay. And on these issues, Israel is not involved. Could not be involved. My view was the Arab word plus dual manusami dual jiwar. I'm using the term in Arabic, basically. Turkey, Iran, and Ethiopia, for instance, okay? It's not a closed club. The idea here is to play by the Helsinki book. So it's not a sub-regional. Here, the Arabs could develop their own views. But the issue here is to have guidelines, meaning respecting, this is why I said a mild Westphalianism. I don't, if, I, I, if I speak over your head as a state, it's no serious that we talk together after, I know, basically. So respecting the concept, the culture of statements talking to each other, basically. And slicing, the salami tactic of slicing the thing is that we, where we agree, we, we can talk. Where we disagree, we don't talk. I'll give you a simple example. Those who say it's idealistic, what we are saying. And first, no Gulf, no Maghreb, no so, because it, you know, it smells something, it's clear. 
at that time. But basically, the Muslim countries around the Arab world and Ethiopia also, plus, because they are present, basically. What is the idea here? The idea here is to be able to address issues that can be addressed together and to contain the effect or the impact of, of other issues and not allow them to impact on other uh, uh, relations. And my example is, is, is very simple. Years back, I'm sorry I'm quoting myself because I'm speaking, I suggested that if you want to address the issue of Syria, we have to have what I call an external ta'if before having an internal ta'if. Because with Lebanon, there was an external ta'if. When the deputies came to discuss, the nannies outside, I'm sorry to use this term, our nannies, which told us this is the only game in town, guy. You sit and talk or otherwise, you know, you'll have a car accident, you know, whatever is, could happen to you, basically. So, which was a good advice. Now, the external ta'if, and I've raised that, I'm saying in 2012, to say one year after Syria. I said we need an external tie for Syria, which meant what, what the French have raised after Monsieur Macron as a group of contact, group of contact. I'm not preaching the Iranian view. I totally disagree with Iran. It doesn't matter to Iran if I disagree with them. But how could you sit and say, only my friends discuss Syria, but not my enemy who's present like me and more than Syria? I mean, if Iran is a problem in the contact group, it's more of a problem outside the contact group. So basically, you have a Taif group, like about Lebanon. I call the Taif to Lebanonize, Lebanonize everything. But the idea here is this group of contact, which the French have raised after, is to have the countries that, are, that have interest and that are present to discuss the parameters of that matter. So again, when we talk about a conference on security and cooperation, some would say Europeans and Mediterranean, but I would say Muslim world to say Arab world and its neighbors plus Ethiopia. The idea is to develop guidelines of state-to-state -state interaction, extremely realistic. I insist this is the most realistic. I cannot have everything or nothing. <coughs> so we go, we slice the issue, issue-based approach, but not a Gulf one. And that was my answer, you said, that was my answer to our Iranian friend. And it's Pax Iranic. <coughs> Iraq is Iranized with all the respect, and the others are not in Boucher, and cannot stand up to you. You don't, you don't go and slice it. This is why I considered in my, at that time, talk that Four countries should take the initiative, though they disagree, some of them with some of them. Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, and Iran. I mean, these are the four big guys that should accept and promote this idea. It could start by track two, track one plus point five, that since the Palestinian issue, <laughs> and move into that. I think this is a very realistic matter because not accepting to talk to somebody and suddenly relinquishing everything to that somebody at one point of time is problematic. External powers which have good relations with everybody, we mentioned Russia for instance, or the Americans to go back. The, the problem today, the Americans is absent, are absent basically, but only on breaking rules of a game or just every other day getting out or with a new idea. The Europe, our European friends, unfortunately, I mean, very wise, but they don't project any power in that respect, basically. But these powers could be supportive and could be helpful in any architecture of the sort, in any complex architecture of the sort. Whereas we agree that we disagree, but we agree that if we disagree, we, don't, we can't reach anything. So let's slice this agreement and see where we agree and where we disagree and we contain the disagreement. That's the idea. So. Otherwise, it's anarchy. This is what we, yani the, sorry, before you, uh, dear. Otherwise, it's, we are living in a total disordered order that's breaking down. The states are breaking down. Today, just if you allow me one thing, we used to be afraid of the, some are afraid of the nuclear proliferation. And I am afraid of the proliferation of failing states in the Middle East. Failing states that could become failed overnight. <laughs> Just now I have to bring you back to Lebanon. Okay. You went too far. <laughs> so Everything is in Lebanon. Exactly. So although we cannot uh, think of Lebanon in isolation of what's happening in the region, whether in security, political, all this uprising and so on. But now we're back to the practical steps. What can bring the people out of the street? Do you think the formation of a new government can do that? according to what they are asking. And this government, could it be really 
be formed without the interference of the external players? It's not Christmas, so I don't believe in miracles, <laughs> basically. No, but there is a good blessing, and there is sometimes wise interference to accept it. The people might be weakened in the street. Some are counting on that over time. But the issues that brought them to the street will not die, because issues they face up to every morning. You don't have enough. I mentioned very fast, 30 to 33% poverty and under poverty line children not having enough calories. I mean, basically. So it's not an issue of ideological preference or strategic preference. Or, so, so basically, this will pop up every day. And the economic crisis today is easier to attack than tomorrow. And some are questioning how, to, how can we, by next year, bring the deficit to 0.6% of the you know, budget income, of the international income, when it's 9.6, reading to 10 now. I mean. To GMP, I'm sorry. So, but still, you, you cannot have only temporary solution in taxing the banks or asking them to reduce the interest rate by a certain percentage for one year. What, what about 2021? I'm going to ask. Why didn't you do it before? So basically, what will start bringing people out of the street is to, to have them feel that there are some concrete results that they are feeling each and every day. For instance, the principle of progressive taxation, we don't have it in Lebanon. You know, the only people who are taxed are those who are working or having a salary. Taxation are on indirect products. Most indirect products are necessity in Lebanon. They are not luxurious products. So all these matters will not bring people. If, there is, if you suppress part of it, you try to buy time, you try to derail the others because of certain great strategic interest, as we have seen it happening, unfortunately, to a certain extent in the South, you are not addressing the issue. People are still ill-fed, still feeling not having enough money to eat or to have a shelter or to send their children to school or to do this and that. So basically, the only thing is to have real concrete achievements. Real, real concrete achievements. I will doubt that tomorrow or next week, because promises will not take them out of the street. Achievement will take them out of the street. Uh, one thing is to engage in these new uh, certain economic policies of job creation. And for instance, one funny thing happened. One of the 17 points read by the by former Prime Minister uh, Saad Hariri, who might be returning or not returning, I don't know, basically is to stop you know, uh, what you call state investment. Stopping state, and what was the reason? Because of corruption, money is going to have stop corruption, but state investment is creating jobs. I mean, if the big boss of my community is getting 30% in his pocket, so don't, you don't want to deprive him of 30%, but you're depriving me of a job, you're sending me home, you're creating more joblessness. I mean, so you see, th this is one of the points we mentioned. You, you, you know them and we know them. So you need to go, I mean, the PPP, private public partnership, okay. You decided the Middle East and whatever is, but you have to see what could be done and what could not be done. And second, you cannot do it in 24 hours. That we know. You have, you, you, you have to enact laws that takes time to prepare laws, so on and so on. So basically, trying to defuse by promises is not the good medicine. It will not take people out of the streets. On the left. Yes. Uh, this Geographic left. Probably, yeah. probably the, the, lady, the last question. And then, yes. Uh, is there another one? Yeah. And, yeah. So these are the last two questions. And, yes. and okay. Uh, is it probable that Hezbollah would use its military power through this crisis? And what conditions that may happen? Okay. I will take the second question. Yes. Too, yes. So I will just take the second question. This is regarding Hezbollah too. So regarding this new political model. How can you convince the internal factors in specific Hezbollah to lay down his arms and integrate in this new model and face the external interventions? Well, one thing is clear. I mean, as I mentioned, I mean, uh, defense policy, security policy, de facto is run by Hezbollah. What we can do, what we cannot do. Uh, and southern Lebanon, as we, we, we all know, for instance, it's no secret when you talk about the deployment of UNIFIL, you don't look what's in the houses, what's underground, you look what's overground. It's a modus vivendi, modus operandi to maintain the situation. They would not use war because you don't use war against fighting. You don't need to fight 
against other communities because it will impact you negatively. You might win militarily speaking, but politically speaking, and there is no need to do that because they're having the upper hand in that matter. At one point of time, there was some pressure used in the streets, as you know, last week. That could be used, but it's also provoking a problem because your people are still suffering. You might calm them down for 24 hours, 48 hours, one week, two weeks, but at the end of the day, you didn't solve their problem. And the state cannot, yani, we are moving into a model of what you call the nanny state now, just employment in the state, just, you know, but we cannot afford. We have sometimes three people for one job, I mean, fake jobs. You cannot go like that. They will not resort to arms because they are in power and they have basically a sort of political majority or they are on the safe side in that matter. They don't need to resort to arms because there is no arm there and it plays against you. If you resort to arms on a sectarian basis, some have warned that it could be like in 2008 in the past when you occupied part of Beirut. But again, with the rising tension of sectarianism, today worse than before at the Middle East level, this will be very dangerous for them. It will create more problems. But today, they would say that their, their official speech is the following, that let's calm down, but definitely we must make reforms. And at the beginning, this intifada, that is according to Nasrallah, was provoked by local factors, socioeconomic factors, but then came somebody to use it. The answer to that is that address it so that nobody could use it and misuse it, basically. I doubt much there is no reason to resort to war against, to fight against them. Even in southern Lebanon, if you could see today, the modus operandi, that there is no fight. At one point of time when Israel were sending its drones, because as I mentioned at the beginning of my intervention, that, southern Le that Lebanon now is entirely integrated in the operational Syrian theater, like Iraq. There are Syri Israeli, Iranian fighting over Iraq, uh, over Syria, but over Lebanon. In southern Lebanon, there was a symmetry, apparently, no rules of the game. You send a drone, I conduct an operation in Sheba farms, and then I conduct an operation on the blue line. But the blue line must not see operations today. The blue line, that's the lines made in, you know, in the past for just as, as uh, not the borders, almost the de facto lines for the UN, basically. So here, there is a sort of restraint and playing by trying to develop new rules of symmetry, not going into, into a war. But the situation is extremely tense, basically because of Syria. And the pro-Syrian regime feels that they are having the upper hand, that the regime didn't go down, so it's winning. So we can move faster on the normalization process. In all that, the great absent from day one has been the Arab world, unfortunately. The greatest absent has been the Arab world. We are only frustrated, keen sometimes, observer of the situation in Syria, watching what the, we don't talk to this, we talk to that, we don't talk to here. You see arch enemy talking to each other. I mean, now the Troika of Turkey, as I mentioned, Iran and Russia are, are running the show. Where are the Arabs in this matter? about Syria, when you say about Syria, definitely it means about Lebanon, and definitely it means Iraq, and definitely it means the Levant, and definitely it means the Arab-Israeli conflict. Look at all these matters, and you are entirely absent to just make statements, not you, of course, you know, <laughs> official Arab world, every now and then, just like that. Total absence, total absence. And I still believe on that matter, what you need again and again <coughs> is this group of contact that's inclusive of all those who are fighting. Otherwise, I'm sorry to say it's not a serious approach. You don't have to be in love with your enemy, but you have to admit that your enemy is there. Try to talk to him or to her, and later on you see what to do. Why I'm saying this? Because this will impact greatly on Lebanon. I mean, we are very much, everybody has a consensus, there is a consensus that what would happen in Syria greatly impacts, and especially one more time, we were relieved at one point of time, but we have been reintegrated entirely, we and Iraq, into the Syrian uh, theater of strategic confrontation. Thank you very much, uh, Nasif. Um, this was uh, a very rich presentation, a very rich discussion, and extremely uh, wealthy with, uh, with ideas, uh, with suggestions, with uh, reflections. It will be difficult for me to uh, bring out the most important points that were raised in the discussion. But let me first address something. You are provocative, as you said to Ambassador Rahm. 
you repeatedly said civil state, civil state, civil state. I wish to insist that Egyptians should lay claim to the invention of this term. Should? Lay claim to the invention of the term. Civil state, the Dawud al madaniya was invented in Egypt. And in fact, no one had ever heard of this concept in political science. So let's just put things straight. It's not a Lebanese invention, it is no, an Egyptian. Not, it's an Egyptian it. invention. We should not be very well, proud of it, by the way. Anyway. Should not be very proud of it anyway, but this, I think, I'd like, I only wanted to. Second, I think it's very interesting that in all 15 days in Lebanon, and the Lebanese complaining from the dire economic situation, not one time were Syrian refugees mentioned. Not once were Syrian refugees blamed, which is something indicative of the necessity to avoid blaming Syrian refugees and refugees in general for what misgivings we may have in our countries. I just wanted to, to emphasize that. My, my third, uh, my third uh, uh, comment would be on uh, Lebanon's, the immediate solutions to the, to, Lebanese, to the Lebanese situation nowadays. And you're absolutely right that reducing budget deficit, in fact, may exacerbate the problems. Yeah? Because, uh, and we know something about that in Egypt also. Uh, reducing budget deficits between 2016 and 2019 raised rates of poverty and uh, uh, raised cost of living. So, in fact, this is probably not uh, the uh, solution expected. Maybe, maybe uh, the very rich and active Lebanese civil society, uh, trans-communitarian, trans-sectarian, may work uh, towards building a new political culture, a new political culture away from the leaders of the communities. These are the communities who have entrenched interests in, uh, in, in continuing, in, in extending uh, the life of sectarianism, even with some, uh, some uh, plastic surgeries to, uh, to, to the sectarian, uh, sectarian system. But I think most importantly, uh, what you have brought to the discussion and what uh, was emphasized is that you cannot talk about Lebanon without talking about the region. The problems of the region are uh, the bane of Lebanon. And the problems of Lebanon are also reflected in, uh, in, in the region. I think you talked about concessionism several times, in fact, one tragedy was the export of consociationalism from Lebanon to Iraq. Iraq, which did not have the culture of consociationalism. So it was much more uh, uh, tragic. Uh, in, fa in fact, in fact the, the Lebanese civil war did not produce as many victims as the Iraqi situation produced after 2003. So I think this is extremely, extremely important. And what you have is, in fact, a sort of collapse of the regional system. And this is why the issue of the Conference on Security and Cooperation in the Middle East uh, has, has, come, has come about. But the Conference on Security and Cooperation in Europe, Helsinki, was not only about security. It was about economic cooperation. It was about culture and human rights. And I think this is a dimension that the denial of which has been at the origin of, of what, what we're living. So uh, secularism, uh, non-discrimination, equality uh, on the basis of uh, respect of human rights, this citizenship, 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 I think we may have to invent a new citizenship also in a new, uh, in a new region because uh, our states have relatively failed, not completely, because there is Iraqi nationalism, there is even some sort of Lebanese nationalism, Syrian certainly, but they did not succeed entirely. So we'll have to reconcile this and probably in a larger system, 
uh, uh, when you talked about the Middle East, certainly not about the Gulf, or certainly not about. So I think this is a very important uh, 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 subject uh, for uh, for reflection. Nasif, thank you very much for uh, for your um, your ideas, your reflections, uh, uh, your sincerity, and your enthusiastic delivery as well, uh, which also established uh, a contact. Uh, with, uh, with, uh, with, with the audience. I will certainly convey to uh, Dean Fahmi uh, uh, how, how interesting, how lively, how uh, rich this discussion, uh, this discussion was. He uh, will certainly regret not having been here. He's away from Egypt, and of course, you know, he would have liked to be here, so I will do that and on, um, on, on my own behalf as well. I would like uh, to thank you as, as uh, uh, the very good uh, friend uh, that, uh, uh, that you are. Uh, thank you for, for being here. Uh, this is uh, not uh, uh, an alien place to you. This uh, was yours at a certain point in time. Uh, and um, uh, once again, this was a very timely uh, Tahrir dialogue and uh, we hope to uh, receive you soon with good news about uh, progress in Lebanon and in the region towards uh, the solution of the rails. Thank you very much to all of you for coming. You are very nice to be here. Bye-bye.